All right, I think we're going to get started now. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, exploring new foods with picky eaters. If this is your first time to one of our caregiver webinars, uh, welcome. If, um, if you've been to some before, we're glad to have you back. My name is Kelly LeBlanc. Um, I am a BCBA at Behrman. I, have, um, I currently live in Denver, but I used to work at um, some of the Massachusetts locations, so I'm pretty familiar with that area. Um, and I've worked for Behrman for uh, almost nine years now, so uh, I know quite a few people here. Um, Ashley Allers is not joining us today, um, but she is one of our feeding experts at Beerman. So um, she sometimes leads this webinar as well. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's jump into it. So uh, just a few things to go over. Everyone is on mute right now. So if you want to ask a question, um, you can unmute yourself um, or you can just type it in the chat. Uh, this presentation is going to be a lot more fun if it's interactive, um, so please ask questions throughout. Um, we're happy to kind of chat through uh, the different things we're going to talk about today. So just a little bit about Beerman to get us started for anyone who's new to these caregiver webinars. Uh, Beerman Autism Centers is a place where young kids engage in play to learn foundational skills uh, that they can build on, such as self-advocacy and communication. We recognize that every kid's success is unique, and so we take a one-on-one -on -one approach that allows us to drive progress, uh, use measurable outcomes, which is kind of a, a hallmark of ABA, and um, we want to make sure each kid is advancing on their own terms. Uh, so uh, our main focus is really to make sure that learning is fun and that our learners are, uh, are um, gaining a lot of great skills even uh, without realizing that they're working. So in order to achieve these goals, we have five pillars. Um, so the first one is let kids be kids. Uh, every kid is unique. The second is to learn through play. Uh, we don't really sit at tables all day. I don't know if, you know, sometimes that is a, a stereotype of ABA, but that's not what we do. We try and focus on play. Um, the third one is to empower um, our, you know, our learners. So we really want to focus on communication um, and teaching them to advocate for themselves. Uh, the fourth one is engagement with families. Um, so we're always focused on your family's goals and making sure that we're, you know, all collaborating as one team to really support, support that kid as much as possible. And finally, uh, commitment to progress is our last pillar. Um, so we really want to get our learners to progress as fast as possible for them um, to, you know, make sure we can catch them up to, to where they need to be. Uh, so just a um, uh, kind of a brief overview of what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about some different types of eating disorders. Um, we'll talk about challenges that your family may face with a picky eater. Um, we'll also talk about how ABA and a multi multidisciplinary approach can help uh, with any feeding issues. And then we'll talk about some tips for changes. Um, you can make right now at home. So first a disclaimer, um, uh, it's essential to uh, contact your child's physician um, first regarding any feeding concerns. Uh, any potential medical conditions must be ruled out before we start uh, using behavioral interventions for feeding. Um, this is really crucial to success with any feeding program Without treating underlying medical conditions, uh, behavioral progress can be um, very difficult or, or not possible or, you know, just not, not the best approach for, for that child. All right, so first we're going to discuss briefly some feeding issues uh, that you may be encountering. 
So these are some different types of feeding issues. Um, the DSM-5 details some different ones. So the first one, uh, you know, is pica. Um, so that is persistent eating of non-nutritive non um, non-food substances over a period of at least one month. Um, so basically eating non-food items. Um, rumination is repeated regurgitation of food over the period of at least one month. Um, so regurgitated food might be rechewed or re-swallowed or spit out. Um, and then RFID or avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Um, that is the one we're, we're gonna, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide, but um, this is the one we're gonna focus on. Um, uh, so just know that your learner does not need to be diagnosed with um, RFID to need assistance with feeding issues. Um, so while we do need medical clearance to work on feeding issues, we don't necessarily need a diagnosis. Um, we just need confirmation that the issue is likely behavioral in nature and not medical. So um, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder is a feeding or eating disturbance. Um, so that might look like a lack of apparent interest in eating food, avoidance based on the sensory characteristics of food, uh, concern about aversive consequences of eating. Um, and this can manifest by persistent failure to meet appropriate nutritional or energy needs, so like calorie consumption, um, associated with one or more of the following. Uh, so there could be significant weight loss, um, so, or failure to achieve like a specific weight uh, milestone within their growth. Um, there could be a significant nutritional deficiency. There also could be dependence um, on like feeding or nutritional supplements. And then there also could be um, a clear like interference with psychosocial functioning. Um, so just a reminder, while like the behaviors um, that you may experience might be similar to what you're like reading in this diagnosis. Uh, diagnosis is not necessary. So in ABA, we treat interfering behaviors. Um, and if these behaviors don't have a medical origin, then we can treat them. So here are some common issues um, your child with autism might be exhibiting. Uh, so the first one is avoiding or refusing to try new foods. Um, I think this one can be, is very common. Uh, the second one is sticking to the same small set of foods. They also might uh, have a specific brand that they prefer or color or texture um, that they'll, they'll, they'll kind of stick to. Uh, there also might be a lack of variety, uh, particularly with like more nutritional foods like fruits and vegetables. Um, or they might refuse to sit down for meals or sit down for very short periods of time for meals and then um, kind of get up and run away. So some family challenges. Uh, so, you know, creating separate meals um, can be really time consuming. Um, difficulty going out for meals, it might not even be possible. Um, bringing uh, specially prepared moods or sorry, foods when you're traveling um, to different places. Um, and there also might be nutritional deficits, which can, um, you know, cause a lot of problems for the family. So uh, just, you know, a uh, little survey, if you guys are willing to um, post in the chat, um, has anyone here like experienced any of these um, within your family? Yes, so I got one person saying they're preparing a lot of different meals and it is very tiring. Um, yeah, all of these are an issue. I think I think these are common across families. Um, I think a lot of like parents end up struggling um, with this at some point. Um, so we'll, we will, um, okay, great, all of them. All right, we're gonna break down all of them within our training um, today and we will um, kind of talk about different ways to approach. Um, these challenges. Um, all right, so uh, potential causes. Um, 
some causes are medical and some are going to result as, um, you know, challenges related to um, an autism diagnosis. Um, so we'll kind of break them down. So there could be medical issues. Uh, reflex can be a common issue um, and it can make it really uncomfortable for a child to eat certain foods or a certain amount. Um, and that reflex can be associated with like different times where they experience that reflex and like with different foods. Um, there also could be sensory defensiveness. Um, so uh, children can have different um, texture triggers. So something really mushy might be an issue or something super crunchy that results in like a loud sound. Um, even though it doesn't have to do with like taste or feel in their mouth, either the sound itself could be um, a sensory issue for them. There also could be lack of generalization. Uh, so this can be a, a pretty significant barrier. So your child might be stuck um, on not only eating the same food, but also the same flavor and the same brand. Uh, for example, uh, like only Trader Joe's raspberry yogurt. So, you know, if you go shopping at a different grocery store one day um, and you don't get to Trader Joe's that week and, you know, they won't eat like the different type of raspberry yogurt. Um, and then underdeveloped skills. So they could have, you know, issues with chewing. Um, there's very specific ways that your tongue moves around your mouth. So it can be hard for them to manage and swallow their foods. And I think um, without like uh, a lot of training in that area, that can be a hard thing for like any like outside person to just like look at them and, and notice. Um, but it can affect how like safe and comfortable it is to eat certain foods. Um, so, you know, your child might not feel safe when um, certain foods are presented to them and therefore they might avoid eating them. All right, so next we're going to uh, talk about how we can use ABA therapy to, to address some of these concerns. Uh, so ABA focuses on replacing socially significant restricted behaviors with more adaptive skills. Um, so some positive results of changing your child's eating behavior could include increasing their social opportunities with peers. Um, so they might be able to then eat lunch at the lunch table. Um, they might be able to go to birthday parties um, and eat there. It can also decrease stigma stigmatization. So um, you will then not need to pack a special lunch, which I, I saw like a lot of you guys talking about in the chat. Um, or like avoid certain scenarios around food. Um, it'll allow them to explore. So you'll be able to travel more, you know, you could maybe go to the zoo or the pool um, without all that extra food planning. Um, it can help with their nutrition as well. So it can increase their, um, their diet to be more well-balanced and positively impact their overall health and wellness. Uh, so one technique that we often use is shaping, um, and this isn't specifically just for food. So you might have heard this word before, but um, uh, this is something that is often used within feeding therapy in ABA. Um, so shaping focuses on slow changes. Um, we want it to be really easy for that learner to adapt. Uh, not going too fast for your kid is going to be essential. Uh, we really don't want them to have a negative experience with, with eating. Um, negative experiences are likely to lead to setbacks um, within their progress. Um, so it'll just end up taking longer over time. Um, so some examples of shaping uh, could include like cleaning up. So maybe uh, your, your kiddo has like a hard time, you know, picking, like cleaning up after they play with a bunch of toys. Um, that I think is very common. Um, so teaching them, you know, maybe instead of having them pick up all of their blocks, they, you know, just pick up two pieces to start and then you slowly increase expectation over time. Um, nail cutting is another time we might use shaping. So um, if nail cutting is something that um, your kid doesn't like, we might just start with um, only cutting one fingernail at a time. Or you might even just start with like bringing the nail clippers close to their, um, their hand. Um, 
and then eating, um, which is what we'll talk more about. Um, so, you know, we don't start with um, eating a whole um, new thing for dinner. Maybe they just they lick a strawberry or they smell it. Um, and we start encouraging like all of those behaviors of just interacting with their food. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is reinforcement. Um, reinforcement is a crucial part of ABA therapy. Um, so that happens anytime you add or take away something that will increase the probability that that behavior is going to happen more in the future. Um, so this is our most powerful tool to change behavior. Um, it works quickly. Um, it, we can start small. Um, and then we can quickly build momentum with small positive changes. Um, so some examples, um, your child might hand over a toy when you say like, you know, my turn. And then you, you say like, oh, thank you so much. And you tickle them. Um, and so, you know, your, your praise and your tickles would be functioning as a reinforcer. Um, your child uh, might be sitting and playing quietly. So you um, come over to them and start talking to them about what they're playing with. Um, and they're, you know, more likely to like tolerate playing by themselves in the future. Um, and then an eating example would be if, you know, your child tries a piece of um, maybe an orange um, and then you like make a funny face afterwards um, and they laugh. And so like all of those things are going to um, ideally lead to uh, some like behavior change in the future. And then finally, um, effectiveness is um, uh, a really important part. Um, so one of like the most effective ways um, to address feeding issues is to collaborate and use a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and so we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slides, um, but it's important to, as we talked about, think about the medical aspect. Uh, you want to think about the behavioral aspect, and then we often include um, speech therapy and OT, um, and everyone kind of collaborates together in order to develop an effective feeding intervention. So now we're going to discuss um, how we can use uh, this multi multidisciplinary approach at Beerman Autism Centers. So research looks um, at a lot of topics, um, such as expanding preferences, decreasing problem behavior, um, and that's kind of what a BCBA would do. Um, the BCBAs can also create programs, um, and those programs might be aimed at things like sitting at the table, um, increasing their ability to try new foods, or increase the amount of uh, food eaten during a meal, so kind of like volume of food eaten. Um, so once we develop consistent and effective strategies at the center, then we'll, we will help train parents on how to use those in interventions at home. Uh, the behavior technician is always part of the feeding team too. Um, so the BTs are going to run the programs frequently in the center. Uh, they can provide data on progress to the BA um, and they're also gonna highlight any idiosyncrasies that they see. Uh, so they can try different ways to, pre to present demand. So they might kind of change up their phrasing. Uh, they might say, you know, first then, or like, let's try, um, let's try it together um, and see if, you know, that changes anything. Uh, the occupational therapist um, will collaborate with the family and the behavior analyst. Um, so OTs can provide great instruction on prerequisite uh, motor feeding skills. So like sitting or their fine motor skills. Um, they also focus on feeding and teaching the skills needed for independent utensil use. Um, so they might um, have things like modified utensils, cups or bowls that can be um, essential for future success. So sometimes you just need, you know, that, that modified utensil to to start seeing some independence and then we can, you know, work on like fading that out over time. 
Um, and then finally, proper sitting positions and chairs can have a really positive impact on uh, that kid's comfort and um, really like feeling safe while they're eating and chewing and swallowing. Um, and then speech and language pathologists also will collaborate with like the family, the OT and the behavior analyst. Um, the SLP um, can develop oral motor skills needed for all types of foods. Um, so liquids or purees or solid foods. Um, uh, they also have a great deal of knowledge on swallowing, um, the different chewing stages, and then overall like mouth and throat mechanics. So like we talked about earlier with, um, you know, kids needing the skills to move food around in their mouths, this is something that an SLP could help out with. So let's dive into uh, what you can do right now to work on these behaviors, because I'm guessing that is what everyone is waiting to hear. Uh, so getting started, um, you're gonna first wanna rule out any underlying medical issues. So talk to your child's pediatrician. Uh, you may need additional consults with like a gastroenterologist. Um, sometimes they recommend a swallow study um, and that would look at like, you know, the um, kid's ability to swallow food, um, or they might ask for a formal feeding evaluation um, and refer you to like a feeding specialist. Um, so that should always be step one. Um, so if you haven't done that, start, you know, thinking about like who you need to call if you need help identifying, you know, specific people to call. Um, uh, you can always ask the BA, but your pediatrician is a good place to start. Um, and then uh, next, we're going to work on setting up consistent mealtime routines and expectations. Um, so consistency is always going to be key um, with, you know, a, a lot of these things. Um, so setting up just a few consistent routines or expectations can really go a long way. Um, yep. Sorry. Probably to interrupt, we had a question come in. Okay, uh, someone said that they are told it's a two-year wait to see a feeding therapist. Really? Wow. Um, do you, like, uh, if you want to, like, send me your information, I can see if, like, we can help you find anyone that has um, an earlier opening, um, because that is a really long time. That's, like, not a very... Um, effective amount of time to wait. Um, sometimes like uh, the pediatrician can recommend like other people who aren't like necessarily like a feeding specialist, but they might be able to do a swallow study um, or like they work on like GI stuff. I know like a lot of uh, kids go to GI doctors um, for some of these things. So there might be some other um, options. For, for us to go, but yeah, that is a really long time. So um, sometimes while we're waiting for a uh, like feeding evaluation to be done, there are like some things we can do um, while we wait. Um, so we're not completely uh, putting their interventions on pause too. Yeah, so. uh, someone else said that they are receiving speech and OT from Beerman, but they're still waiting for feeding therapy. Oh man, okay. Um, well, I will, um, I will like reach out to see if there's any like resources we can offer or like, you know, I would say stay on the wait list you are, um, but we can continue to try and like figure out if there's a way we can help you guys better with, with this in the future. Um, and so. another person though does have a, a good tip or feedback there their son has a feeding tube. Um, so speech no tea focus on feeding does help. So although not a food uh, specialist, uh, speech no tea can help. Yes, yes, yeah. So like um, a lot of our speech and OT on staff have um, like some experience with feeding. So there's often like, you know, things we can do in the meantime um, to still like, you know, safely intervene on whatever issue um, the, the child is having. So I think there are still like some options, um, but I will, um, 
I will type uh, my email into the chat and you guys are welcome to reach out. And if you want to give me like specific details, I can try and help coordinate um, to see if we can, you know, do anything to get that started. And we will also send the recording out to everybody afterwards. And in the message, we'll be sure to include Kelly's email. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, all right. Uh, so where were we? All right. So once we, you know, start um, setting up consistent routines and expectations, um, then we are going to start, you know, trying different interventions um, to incorporate new foods into their routine. Um, so uh, trying like a few interventions during new routines um, can systematically expose your child to some new foods or experiences. And so we'll talk about some of the ones that you can definitely like do safely, even if you haven't had um, all the feeding um, specialist uh, report yet. So uh, setting them up for success, um, there are some like really like small things we can try to focus on first. Um, so the first one is to limit grab and go eating and snacking. Um, so the grab and go eating is when your child like grabs a chicken nugget from the table and then like, you know, takes one bite and then maybe like drops it back off on the table and like runs over and plays with the toy and then comes back and takes one more bite. And it might take them like a really long time to finish, you know, one chicken nugget. Um, they may or may not come back to the table. Um, so the more repetitive snacking uh, that it happens, um, the less hungry your child will be at mealtimes. Um, so this is, I'm not saying that you shouldn't offer snacks at all. Like definitely, you know, offer snacks. Kids sometimes eat a lot, but um, uh but just try to time them so that they're not so close to the meal time. So, you know, think about, you know, when you're getting like an hour or two hours before the next meal time, you might stop um, offering snacks or like, you know, maybe we dial it back on, on how much you're giving. Um, the second one is to limit distractors at the table. Um, so distract at the table can interfere with your child's ability to listen to their hunger cues um, and it also might increase their likelihood to avoid or refuse food when they might in fact be hungry so um, you know like the whatever else is at the table um, like maybe it's like a video that they're watching um, that might be more interesting than whatever food you presented um, so you might need to start small. I'm definitely not saying that just like, you know, if you if that's a routine, having the TV on or the iPad there, um, you don't necessarily wanna just completely take it away, but maybe you start, you know, waiting a few minutes before you present the, the tablet. So, you know, the food gets presented first and then the, the like, you know, video gets turned on like 30 seconds later or a minute later and you slowly start to increase that. Um, Setting up consistent meal times can be um, uh, key. Um, so uh, you are going to decide when and what your child eats, but um, your child will decide how much. So we're, we're not going to like you know force them to eat, um, but uh, you know we're just picking when the times happen. So we won't you know let the kids stay hungry, but if you can. If you plan consistent snack times and meal times, um, they are going to have um, another chance to eat later if they refuse food at one of them. Um, and so another suggestion, it would be to use shaping and um, have your child try and take small bites of the main meal and then have like a scheduled time that you're going to present it later um, so they can finish eating. Um, you can also create meals with items that they like and don't like. So um, that, you know, there, there are options there. Um, so you can require small bites of what they don't like um, and then as much as they want of what they do like. Um, and so those are just some options. Um, different things are gonna work for different kids though. So, you know, feel free to play around with it. Um, Incorporating family style meals um, is a like fantastic thing to do. So, 
you know, all the food stays in the middle of the table and then there's less pressure to eat because we're not the ones putting the food onto their plates. Um, and so they can kind of pick from, you know, the center of the table what they want to put onto their eat and onto their food and eat, or sorry, onto their plate and eat. Um, so they're still getting exposure to all the like aspects of eating and seeing um, these foods and they're seeing other people eat these foods, um, but there's no pressure to try them. Um, and so, you know, even it seems really small that even just, um, you know, having that food item in sight or smelling that food item um, or, you know, just tolerating being near that food item can can really like increase their success in the long term. Um, yeah. This is a good spot. Uh, we do have a question. Um, how do you work toward family style meals if your child prefers to eat separate ingredients rather than a more complex dish? For example, spaghetti and broccoli separate rather than combined in a big bowl. Oh yeah, that, that is a great question. Um, so I would say like have, you know, a couple like bowls out. So like maybe keep it separate if possible. You know, if like say you're making like pasta with like, like, um, you know, like sauce and like meatballs, like you could have like a family style meal where you don't like mix it all together, but you have like each item like separate on the table. And so everyone can go around and like serve themselves and like take their own pasta and then like pour on like how much sauce they want and like if they want to take meatballs or if they don't want to take meatballs. Um, but that way, like everyone can kind of pick what they want to put together for their meal. Um, but all the options are there for everyone. Um, and you can even have things out that like maybe don't go together, right? So like maybe, you know, chicken nuggets are also there, which isn't something we normally eat with um, that kind of meal, but like all the options are kind of there for everyone and then everyone can pick and choose um, kind of what they put together. If they put anything together, if they eat everything separate, that's okay too. Um, sometimes, you know, people don't like it when their food touches other food. So, um, I know plenty of adults who are like that. Um, so that can be a good way to kind of, um, still eat family style, but have, um, the option of, you know, individualizing their own plate. Um, so, uh, it is, um, uh, super important to remember that I can take a lot of exposures to develop a preference um, for a new food um, or know whether you truly like something or not. Um, so if it appears that you, you know, have something out and your child really doesn't like that, um, don't, don't have a big reaction to that. You know, it's fine. Like they can, you know, decide if they want to eat like beans this week or not eat beans, um, but just try to keep your reaction to a minimum so we don't kind of interfere with that process of exposure to a new food. Um, and then just try it again another time. Um, like the slide says, it, it can take more than 10 exposures to develop a preference for a new food. Um, I'm sure everyone here has had something that they did not eat in the past, um, that they now enjoy eating. Um, and so, you know, our taste buds also change over time. Um, so, you know, just representing it and kind of always making it a, an option can be helpful. Um, all right, so one thing that can be helpful is slowly incorporating new foods. Um, so one thing you can do is make it fun. Um, another thing you can do is start small, which literally means starting with small foods. Um, you can also change the texture, color, and shape. You can combine um, new and preferred foods together. Um, and then you can also use reinforcement like we talked about. So we're gonna go into each of these strategies in a little bit more depth um, and we can, we'll kind of demonstrate how you can bring new foods into the mix. Um, so we're gonna start with uh, some ideas on how to make eating fun. Um, so you can incorporate dips. Um, if your child likes particular dips, um, you can add new like vehicles for those dips. So whether that's like, 
you know, carrots or cucumbers or veggie sticks. Um, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be something you would necessarily, you know, use with that dip, but you can just try out different things. Um, I've seen plenty of kids eat, you know, carrots with um, ketchup, which doesn't sound great to me, but I, you know, a lot of people really love it. So, um, uh, yeah, and you, you can just try out, try out different things that are paired with the dip. Um, you can also play with your food. Um, so this can make mealtime more fun and interesting. Um, this, you know, can be messy, um, but it can pair really like good experiences with that food. Um, so, you know, like the classic making a spoon into an airplane for babies, you can make the meal times for your kids more enjoyable um, and less boring. So it kind of feels like a fun game that they're doing. Um, so some ideas here, like, you know, French toast sticks, um, jump into a syrup swimming pool. Um, you can, you know, use veggie straws with mustaches. Um, uh, you can also use finger foods and small pieces. Um, so kids often want autonomy when they're um, eating. And so finger foods can be a great way to give them that control. So it lets them control the amount they're eating, the pacing, what they pick up, um, and it can be easier for their, you know, their small hands to manipulate um, finger foods. Um, shapes and colors can make it, you know, fun. So um, cookie cutters are really great for this. So who doesn't, you know, love a heart-shaped pancake for Valentine's Day? Um, there's plenty of, you know, like low cost cookie cutters you can get to, to make them into different shapes. Um, adding colors can also make it more interesting. So, um, getting like a little bit of food dye and throwing that in, or using some like, you know, natural coloring, um, can maybe give them that push that they need to, um, make it a little bit more interesting. Um, and then uh, eat with them or like pretend with toys. So, um, you know, kids often like to copy their parents. So you can always model those good behaviors and whatever you're offering for them to eat, even if it's not something you would normally eat, you can, you know, take bites too, maybe make your own plate um, and kind of modeling, model eating things in like silly ways um, or, um, one of my favorite things to do is bring in like a doll or a toy that they really love and then having that, that toy, you know, eat that food and, and playing pretend with that, with that toy. And that can make a huge difference. And like, you know, we're not, we're not telling you you have to eat this, but like, look, like, you know, like, uh, like Marshall from like Pop Trolls, like having fun eating this, this new, uh, food. Um, so... Uh, one of the easiest and most effective interventions for feeding is to focus on size. Um, almost everything is less overwhelming when it's tiny. Uh, so you can, you know, cut in familiar foods into small pieces. Um, that way they can really, you know, examine it. Um, it uh, reduces the effort to try something new. Um, it can also be really helpful for kids that have gag reflexes that are really sensitive. Um, uh, and they might like gag due to different smells um, or textures. This can make it a little bit less overwhelming. Um, and then uh, they can be like quicker to eat each piece. Um, so, you know, each time they put a piece in their mouth, there's there as um they have less difficulty like moving it around their mouth or chewing and swallowing. Um, you can also just put one piece on their uh, plate to, and like at a time or give them like options. Like you might have a couple plates out with small pieces, which gives them a little bit more independence. Um, all right. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is creating slow changes. So slow changes um, can be really effective since children with autism often have difficulty with um, big or sudden changes. So you will know which aspects are the biggest roadblocks for your, for your child. Um, if you're, you know, if you're not sure too, that's totally fine. I would say this is something that is, would be like a good conversation to have with your treatment team. So with the BA, with um, 
the, the speech um, therapist or the OT. Uh, so the first one is color. So you can try the same food, but with a different color. Um, so this can, you know, it will keep everything else the same. The texture will be the same, but you're just trying, you know, the taste is the same. Um, so it might, it's not even a different flavor necessarily, but you just like found a way to, you know, color it differently. So maybe um, you like, the you know kid will eat yogurt or applesauce and you put a little coloring in there to just make it look different um you can also try multicolored uh food items so things like goldfish or like veggie sticks often come in a bunch of different colors um white versus yellow cheddar cheese um which does taste a little bit different but it's pretty pretty similar um and then you can try new foods, but in a similar color to what they normally eat. Um, so like a beige cracker to a beige fried apple. Sometimes oh. a lot of kids eat yeah. like about the same um, colors regularly. Um, and then next you can try changing up the texture. So um, if, you know, mushy textures might be a problem for your kid. Um, so then you start with something more solid and you slowly move to a different texture. Um, and so you're just working on very small changes over time. So we go from apple slices um, to maybe, you know, apple crisp. Um, so like the apple slice is like cooked a little bit. So it gets a little softer. And then you like slowly cook it more and more until you can, you know, have them eat like applesauce. Or you can even, you know, like, um, like just like mash up part of the apple too. Um, so just making very small changes um, can to the texture can um, make a huge difference long-term. Um, yep. Question came through. Uh, would you recommend that meals include small bites for everyone, family style, or all the same size? Uh, so yeah, for eating family style. Um, I think it's, it's um, I guess it depends on like what your family likes. Like if, if everyone's going to be, you know, okay, eating small bites, I think that's fine too. Um, it'll create less work for you during the meal. Um, but you can also like, um, you know, like take that family style meal and like cut up some small pieces for them and put those out as options as well. So they're still like eating the same food. It's just smaller bits. Um, and so, you know, you can, I would say, play around with it, see what like makes sense for you and your family. Um, there's definitely not like one recommendation, I think that you have to follow, um, but it's going to be, you know, kind of like a process where you try different things and see, you know, what, what does your kid respond to and, um, you know, what works best for them. Um, some kids are fine with bigger bites, but, you know, so it's just something to try out. Um, so I guess you, you could do either and just see what happens and I would say report back so you can kind of collaborate with your team um, to figure out, you know, a way that is working and you can kind of do the same thing at the center at, uh, or at home that they're doing at the center. Um, did, the, did that uh, answer your question? I know that wasn't a, a, to a complete answer, but I would say just, just try both, you know, and see what works. Um, all right, so uh, let's move on to the next slide. Um, so shape is another thing you can change. Um, so like thinking about, you know, crackers, there's lots of different shapes of crackers. Um, sometimes you can find the same cracker, but there's like um, a like, uh, like a specific like TV character they might have on the cracker. And so that can be like a really small change to the shape um, that might be like, you know, help them just realize that they can eat, um, you know, different, different foods. Um, uh, you can also utilize different packaging. Sometimes if you're always, if the food is always presented in the same package, um, that can start to become a like signal that like they only want things from that package. Um, which, you know, can, if it's not a problem now, it could become a problem in the future because, um, you know, companies update their packaging, things get discontinued. Um, so trying to use different packaging can be helpful. Um, a yogurt, um, like in a container versus, you know, in a bowl, um, or you can even, you know, 
put it like on a plate or a cup, um, but just using different uh, different like vehicles to serve the food. Um, you can also try like different, you know, fun shapes. So, um, you know, like you can cut up their food into different shapes or arrange it on their plate. So it looks like something that they like. Um, a lot of kids like dinosaur chicken nuggets. I feel like those are the most popular chicken nuggets. Um, you know, they have smiley French fries or like different shapes for macaroni and cheese or cereal. Um, and then liquids is another thing that you can change up. So you can um, do volume fading. Um, so you can slowly dilute the current drink with a new drink to kind of uh, make a really slow shift to something new. Um, so this is something I've seen like most often with, you know, a kid who, who drinks a lot of juice and the parent wants them to start drinking water. Um, so you might start out with um, you know, all, all juice and no water. And then you start, you know, doing like 20% juice and 80% water. This can be helpful if you get like a container or just use like an old juice container and start like, um, like drawing lines on there. So you can know how much you need to fill it up with, um, water versus juice. And then you just slowly change it every like, you know, week or so, um, to add in more. Another, uh, question slash comment came in uh, when my son would eat other foods uh, for example when offered goldfish in the rainbow mix would throw out the other colors and only eat the orange color yes yeah and that that is I think that happens all the time that's like pretty common um which like I think like puzzles a lot of people because all of the goldfish are the same flavor right um so we know it's like just a color thing it's not like um I don't know, like Skittles, where they actually have like slightly different tastes. Um, all the all the goldfish actually have the same color, right? Um, so you can try to, you know, you can try to change it up. Sometimes it's not going to go well, and sometimes they're going to say no. And I think the hard part in that moment is just like accepting that they said no to that thing, and then trying trying again another time, or um, you know, like trying to uh you know do that with other foods like I think that shouldn't be a sign that we stop trying but we're, we don't need to force it in the moment either right um and so I think I think it's great that like you know you're like offering that kid like all uh, you're offering him um like all of the goldfish at once because even if he's not eating all the other colors he's still touching and interacting with them and so maybe you can give him you know like his like bowl of goldfish and then you give him a second bowl so he can like you know, there's like a plate or like a bowl where he knows like, okay, if I don't want this, it's okay. No one's going to force me to eat this. So I don't have to feel stressed out about it. But if I don't want it, I can put it in this other bowl. Um, and so then you're not spending all this extra time, like arranging his food. Like you're not pulling out all the um, other colors for him, which would be time consuming. Um, but instead you're like giving him the, you know, the option and like allowing for him to like independently, um, you know, reject that, that offer if he wants to, or change it himself. Um, and so that I actually, I don't think that's in this, this PowerPoint, but that is like another thing you can do. Um, that can be, um, a good way, especially for kids who don't have a lot of communication skills to tell you that like, they're not comfortable eating something. Um, and so you can kind of have a plate on the side that's like the, you know, like the no plate or the throwaway plate. And so if they don't want something, they don't have to like cry or get upset, to let you know, um, they can just learn to take that like thing that they don't want to eat and put it on the plate that they, you know, they know will be taken away at the end of the meal. Um, and that way they don't feel forced to eat it. Um, cool, thank you for sharing. Um, all right, so next we're gonna talk about combining new and preferred foods. Um, so another technique is to um, take a preferred food and add something new to it. Um, so it can be more hidden. So you might put like some spinach in a smoothie, um, which is a little hard to pick up on unless you have a uh, really uh, like strong taste buds. Um, or it could be more obvious, like tiny bits of like broccoli and mac and cheese where, you know, they can see it and it changes the texture. 
Um, but be aware that a lot of kids will sniff this out pretty quickly um, when you do kind of like mix the foods together um, and they just might refuse the food entirely, um, even when you take away the new component. So do be careful when you try this approach. But it's like, like I said, you know, different things are going to work for different kids. So um, it is something you can try. Um, and then finally, we always want to add reinforcement for new behavior. So anything that is new and positive that we see, we want to make sure that we're immediately reinforcing um, that behavior to increase the likelihood it's going to happen again in the future. Um, so you can provide reinforcement for even really small behaviors. So they might be, you know, taking bite and taking bites and swallowing new foods. Um, or, you know, it might just be something as simple as like touching a new food. Um, you can also work on like smelling new foods or tolerating new foods being around them. Um, if they are taking bites and putting in their mouth, um, you might want to make sure that they actually swallow the food and they don't spit it out later before you provide reinforcement. But I think like all these things are good, you know, steps um, that can be really hard for, for a young kid to take. Um, so we want to make sure we reinforce it. Uh, when you are choosing a reinforcer, make sure it's something that's really preferred. Um, so this will give you the best chance of it actually reinforcing the behavior. Um, one thing you could do is limiting access to that reinforcer so they don't get like bored with it. Um, you can also mix it up throughout the meal time. Um, but it's totally fine if it's like a toy or activity or preferred food. Um, that you're providing like after they do something new. Um, and then you want to start out by reinforcing immediately. So anything, anything that you see that you want to see happen again, um, make sure to, um, you know, pr like provide the reinforcement as soon as it occurs. Make sure like you have it ready ahead of time so you don't have to go and find something after they do it. Um, and be sure to start easy. So don't expect too much. Um, pushing too hard can result in more refusals um, and kind of, you know, contribute to those setbacks that we talked about before. So maybe we start with one bite or we start with smelling or we start with, you know, being okay with like sitting at the table for like three bites before getting up and um, running around. Um, so whatever, whatever they do, that's a little bit better than what they did before. We want to make sure that we let them know by um, using reinforcement. And then uh, that's actually it. So we're gonna wrap up. Um, so, um, you know, try to rule out medical needs first. Um, it seems like a lot of you guys are already um, attempting to do that. So that is great. Um, utilize a multidisciplinary approach if you can. So, you know, have conversations with the SLP, the OT, if they're, isn't one at your um, center, you can um, like ask the, you know, anyone at the, or like the BA at the center or the clinical director, and they should be able to help, um, you know, recommend other services for them. Um, create some new expectations at home. So try to like, try one or two things at a time. Don't go crazy. Um, see, we don't make too many changes at once. So just, you know, maybe pick one thing we talked about and and try that over the next week and see how it goes. Um, and then maybe try something else. Um, try some techniques uh, to add changes um, or new foods to the mix. So start thinking about like what, you know, what might work best for your kid. And uh, the most important thing is just don't give up. So, you know, this is going to be a journey. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, so multiple exposures are always going to be required to trying new foods. Um, and finally, there are some references. These are some really, um, these are some books that we use to uh, create this training for you guys. Um, but um, these are things you're welcome to eat too. A uh, Broccoli Boot Camp is like a really um, popular book for um, working on uh, selective eating. Um, and then uh, Picky Eaters and What to Do is also, it's from the CDC. So they have some good information as well. Um, and that is it. I will open up to questions if anyone has has any.
I just want to say I appreciate you taking the time to put this meeting on. Um, feeding is incredibly difficult for us. With us, our son started out eating everything except for bananas, and now he only eats chips. So, um, yeah, so I definitely appreciate it. I'm at the point now where I'm terrified that if he eats the wrong kind of chip, he'll just stop eating altogether. <laughs> So, um, yeah. again, I, I do appreciate the time that you put. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Yes. And I think, I think that is, uh, you know, that, that is something that is scary when they stop eating what they used to. Um, so I think, you know, just like starting to like help expand their preferences is, you know, a really, really important goal. So thank you for sharing. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, you will receive this recording over the next few days. But thank you so much, Kelly, for an awesome uh, presentation today. Of course, of course. Thank you guys all for coming. <laughs>